to talk about the Morrison Formation, the treasure trove of dinosaur bones that are still yielding up wonders to this day. So imagine, imagine a vast plain stretching as far as the eye can see. In the west, soaring peaks tower above this low-lying plains with rivers tumbling out of the mountain fastness to make their more sedate way eastward across those endless plains. Occasionally volcanoes erupt in the mountains and that spews their ash out up into the sky, which rains onto that vast landscape. Lakes fed by those gushing rivers shimmer in the low angled sun, their shores fringed with ferns, cycads, conifers, ginkgos, horsetails, and the lakes teem with fish and frogs and salamanders and newts, whilst dragonflies hold station above their languid waters. Pterosaurs patrol the skies, and in the fringing forests and out on the plains, dinosaurs roam, thousands and thousands of dinosaurs. This place is the Serengeti of the Jurassic, teeming with bounding life, or 1.5 million square kilometers of it. That is the extent of the Morrison Formation, or if you like, 600,000 square miles. So as time went by, this landscape became buried under younger sediment, which then solidified, hardened, and turned into stone. And then 145 million years ago, the Jurassic ticked over into the Cretaceous period. In 1877, a paleontologist called Arthur Lakes found a fish fossil, and then some dinosaur bones and the world of paleontology was changed forever. So the sediments that were laid down in those floodplains and lakes now lie preserved in what is known as the Morrison Formation. So as we mentioned at the start, the Morrison has been a veritable paleontological treasure trove, having yielded up some of the most iconic dinosaurs ever found. There is a good chance if you were to name one of the classical dinosaurs, it would have come from the Morrison. Dinosaurs like Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Torvosaurus, Camptosaurus, Ornitholestes, Stegosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and a wide range of sauropods, including Diplodocus, Camarasaurus, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, Barosaurus, Haplocanthosaurus, and Supersaurus. So that's quite a list. That's quite a list of dinosaurs. So if we haven't met, my name is Gerald Davey, and I head up the Dinozone. I am the Dino Man. I'm a geologist with a deep interest in paleontology. So the Morrison Formation is where the bone wars were fought out by Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. Those two rivals, probably better called archer enemies, who fought it out. They dynamited each other's quarries, they attacked each other in the scientific publications, they attacked each other in the, in the popular press, they locked each other out of the railway stations, they really behaved badly. And they tried to outdo each other in the number of dinosaurs they dug up and in the number of insults that they could come up with. And it was all very entertaining until it wasn't entertaining anymore. But the Bone Wars is scope for another video, so we will leave that there. And uh, we'll focus on the Morrison Formation. So the Morrison is centered on Wyoming and Colorado, but also outcrops in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. It also outcrops in southern Canada in what is known as the Kootenai Group. The trouble with the Morrison is that 75% of it is buried under younger rocks, making it inaccessible to geologists and paleontologists alike. And where it was caught up in the Rockies, the orogeny, the mountain forming processes that make up the Rockies, the modern day Rockies, much of that has been eroded away. So we've lost that portion of the geological record. But imagine, just imagine how many bones still lie in the Morrison Formation buried under that thick Cretaceous cover, that younger cover. 
it's frustrating to think that no one's going to be able to dig that stuff up and there must be just tons and tons and tons of dinosaur bones, all sorts of other species out there too. So imagine, imagine what bones still lie there buried deep under the younger Cretaceous cover. So they talk about the Morrison being like a Serengeti, the African Serengeti. The diversity of life, quite a dry environment. The Morrison has been likened to it. Of course, things have changed. The animals are different. The plants, the flora and fauna are quite different. But the Morrison formation, the rocks, record the paleoecology of that time. So diving into some geology, a little bit of a deep dive. A geological formation from Wikipedia is a body of rock having a consistent set of physical characteristics or lithology that distinguishes it from adjacent bodies of rock and which occupies a particular position in the layers of rock exposed in a geographical region, the stratigraphic column. It is the fundamental unit of lithostratigraphy, which is the study of strata or rock layers. So if you go and do, if you go and study geology, you will learn a lot about formations and lithostratigraphy or stratigraphy. You can't get around it. But I thought a quick definition of or formation was due because we've been talking at length about the Morrison formation. So what is a formation? And now I think we've tried to explain it a little bit. So the Morrison comprises an accumulation of upper Jurassic sedimentary rocks comprising mudstones, sandstones, siltstones, and limestones, ranging from light gray through greenish gray to red. And as we have already seen, it has been the most productive source of dinosaur fossils in all of North America since Arthur Lakes dug up the first fish fossil there back in 1877. So most of the fossils are to be found in the green siltstones and lower sandstones, which are the geological remnants of that ancient floodplain and river system that we met at the start of this video. So radiometric dating shows that the Morrison Formation dates from 156 million years at its base, which are the oldest beds, to 147 million years at the top, which puts it in the same time frame as the Solhofen Limestone Formation in Germany and the Tendaguru Formation in Tanzania. And we spoke a little bit about this in the previous video on the Brachiosaurus by extension sauropods. And so if you want to watch that video, go and check it out. I don't know where we're going to put the link. Somewhere here, round and about. <laughs> go and check out the link on that video of Brachiosaurus and sauropods. And so at the time of the deposition of the sediments that make up the Morrison, the northern part of the supercontinent of Pangaea, Pangaea, known as Laurasia, had broken up, separating the continents of North America and Eurasia, with North America being located in the subtropics at the time. To the north, the Sundan Sea, an extension of the Arctic Ocean, stretched down through Canada into the United States. So swamps and forests grew in what is now Montana, and the trees that grew in these swamps now lie preserved as coal fields. And to the south, conditions were dry and warmer, leading to the development of desert conditions, and those rocks are preserved as sandstones with huge crossbeds in them, which indicate that they were ancient dunes, ancient sand dunes, which only form in deserts. Oh, and they can also form along coastlines. So when you see cross-bedded sandstone with huge cross-beds, you'll know that those were ancient sand dune deposits. Those are windblown or aeolian deposits forming sand dunes, eventually hardening to become sandstones. So the fossils from the Morrison are often fragmentary, but in spite of that, they provide fantastic, fantastic insights into the creatures and plants, the fauna and flora that lived in the Morrison Basin during the Upper Jurassic. The climate was mostly dry, much like the African savanna of today, but because grasses, flowers, and some kinds of trees had not yet involved, the flora was very different to what we are familiar with today. Conifers, pine trees were dominant back then, along with ginkgo, cycads, tree ferns, and horsetails. And so much of the vegetation grew along the riverbanks and in the floodplains. Dinosaurs were the bosses back then, but fish, frogs, salamanders, and newts, crocodiles, turtles, lizards, pterosaurs, crayfish, clams, and mammalia forms also thrived in that diverse environment. And so the dinosaurs probably hung out close to the rivers. Hundreds of dinosaur fossils have come out of the Morrison, including, as we've seen earlier, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Torvosaurus, Camptosaurus, Ornitholestes, Stegosaurus, and Kylosaurus, and a wide range of sauropods. And for more information on sauropods, check out my video on Brachiosaurus, somewhere to be seen on the link <laughs> in this video. Camptosaurus embryos have also been discovered, which suggests that it was a safe and happy place for dinosaurs to live and raise their young providing sufficient resources for those creatures to thrive. And so the sauropods of the Morrison Formation include Diplodocus, Camarasaurus, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, Barosaurus, Haplocanthosaurus, and Supersaurus. 
I seem to be rattling off long lists of dinosaurs here. How they all got on and managed to survive together in that space is scope for additional scientific study. They must have all had their own feeding strategies to be able to coexist. Otherwise, they would have been competing with each other to the detriment of some of the species there. But maybe when you become a paleontologist, you can work out the various feeding strategies of the sauropods of the Morrison Formation. Right, so that's the end of this episode of the Morrison Formation. Check out our second video where we talk more about the famous places, the famous quarries where these dinosaurs were dug up and who the famous paleontologists were who did do the digging up. So please remember to like, to share and subscribe because it's good for the algorithm, it's good for me. But what's more importantly, it's good for you. And what's not to like about that? Right, I'm out of here. I'll see you on the next one.